Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think that covers all time zones. It's wonderful to have you here with us on this, the final presentation of day two, but don't worry, there's still two more days to come of our conference. Um, and so I'd like to introduce our speaker for this final session. As someone closer to the end than the beginning of their career, I've become increasingly interested in supporting, nurturing and developing those who are coming behind. They won't do what we did. The world has changed, our understanding has changed and we've learned so much and we wouldn't want them to repeat our mistakes. They will find their own paths and they will trailblaze and push back the boundaries of our field. But we can't wait. We need to hear from them now. And the World uh, Council is delighted to have an Emerging Scholar Award. The recipient must be a current member of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. And among other things, they have evidence, must have evidence of impact of research in gifted education in their country or region evidence of outstanding performance for leadership and evidence of service to gifted education. We were delighted to make this award to Alex Week from Paraguay. Alex is an assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology and the Department of Graduate Studies and Research at the School of Philosophy and Human Sciences. Her research interests include social and emotional development of intellectually and creatively gifted individuals, creative and non-linear career paths and personality traits related to these paths. Today, Alex asks us to remain open to openness, the controversy of openness to experience versus overexcitabilities. And so, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Alex Week as our final day two keynote speaker. Alex. Hello. Good morning. I am very excited and honored to be here on this virtual stage presenting on this topic that I find fascinating. At least this morning in my side of the world, I am in Paraguay in South America. So I hope to share this enthusiasm that I have for the topic with all of you. Well, and if not, not enthusiasm, then at least I hope to pique your curiosity because, well, after all, curiosity is a component of openness to experience. So how did this all start? Like, what was the main point? Let's view, like, this is a little bit of the things we're gonna talk about today, okay? So, what it started with the original study that I, that I conducted for openness to experience and overexcitabilities, some of the current views on openness and how they might help in gifted education and talent development, same as overexcitabilities in and outside of the theory of positive disintegration. We will also talk about newer studies that have been done, some common ground that we find, especially divergent paths. Like where, where do we think it's better to take one, like one view versus the other? As well as open science and reproducibility, which is one of the main reasons why openness is still a good idea in my book. And, so how do I get here? How do we get here? It was in 2016, I published a study with colleagues, my mentors at the University of Kansas, where we affirmed that openness to experience is a better construct to explain certain behaviors that are seen in gifted individuals than the more common popular explanation of overexcitabilities. Overexcitabilities have become popular, like mainly in blogs and conversations and Facebook groups, in, in chat forums, and not as much in the scientific literature. And that's where it becomes tricky, you know, Be especially because Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration is a complex 
and very interesting theory that goes well beyond overexcitabilities. And that does not seem to trickle down to the everyday conception of our overexcitabilities. What we read in some of those blogs and some of those posts and some of the conversations that exist is not necessarily what we read in Dabrowski's words, in their works, or in the works of all the individuals that have taken on Dabrowski's mission to continue with the theory of positive disintegration. So how do we get to this anyway? How did this all start? In here's the thing. Exploration of human potential has been at my core since very early. So actually some people might be surprised to hear that I conducted research on overexcitabilities before. To see like what, how, how this happened. But yes. Well, because I follow the science. When I first read over about overexcitabilities, like everyone else probably, I found them fascinating, compelling, logical, as if a missing piece entered the equation. Like, and so, okay, let's read about this. This is fascinating. This I understand so much. I can resonate with this. I can see the curiosity, well, not only in myself, but in other individuals around me. And so in my admittedly developing scientist mind though, I was surprised at the lack of sound research like on the area and the number of blogs that were repeating the same information from the same studies over and over and over again. And so I was confused. If this is so fascinating and if this seems logical, why don't we have more studies about it? Why are the studies limited? Why are the studies, like, why can't we not see this in the scientific literature? And so I did what a researcher does, research. And my results were inconclusive, like most of the research that I reviewed. So was there a difference in overexcitabilities between gifted individuals and the general population? I found some small effect sizes and but in the meantime, the research continued to be scarce and, and the affirmations on the same things continue to be repeated. One just needs to search, like do a Google search to see that all of the literature about like all the blogs, especially over excitabilities that exist. And when they mention scientific information, it's always going back to the same studies. And so Let's talk about a little bit what is openness to experience anyway? Openness to experience is a personality trait in the five factor model of personality. Okay. The five factor model of personality is a theory that is a model actually that was derived from, a, from adjectives in different languages that were describing traits of people. And so openness is a state of cognitive exploration and a desire to engage intensely with the world and with the outer experience and with our inner experience. So in the model of, the, of uh, Costa and McRae, it has six facets, six uh, lower level structures that are vivid imagination, like that power to imagine things in the mind as if they were real and to construct elaborate worlds and to daydream and have fantasy and to move from that into like a rich inner experience. Then high aesthetic sensitivity, which talks about pl like pleasure going and coming in from the senses, experiences that like of art, of beauty, of poetry, a desire for symmetry, for yeah, for that aesthetic pleasure and even referring to some markers like aesthetic chills, you know, when you're hearing a piece that is so fantastic, like a piece of music that you get chills on your spine. Those are called aesthetic chills and are a marker of aesthetic sens sensitivity and therefore of openness to experience. It has been studied. Same as a variety and depth of feelings, like being able to go deep into our feelings and to 
be able to tell the nuances of those feelings. Not necessarily better at regulating those emotions though, but it, the difference between irate and angry and furious and like being able to capture the nuances even more than words might allow. Another facet is openness to actions, which refers to the eagerness to try new things and the preference for variety, the present preference for novelty, the preference for being on the move and finding something else to do. For example, here's a quick test of openness to actions. When you go to a new restaurant, what do you try on the menu? The same thing, the tried and true that you know will deliver and you know you'll appreciate? Or do you try something else, something new that you're like, oh, I have never tried this. Let me try. Worst case scenario, it doesn't taste as good, but in the best, I have tried something new. Then, and so that comes with a lot of flexibility for change and appreciation of change and newness, that fresh look of seeing, seeing something new. It also relates to intellectual curiosity. This is an aspect that is actually separated a little bit from the others. Some theorists actually call it openness slash intellect, the, the personality trait in itself. And this refers to that need for understanding. It is closely related to a phenomenon in psychology called need for cognition. Like we need to understand in depth. I need to understand the theories. I need to understand everything that's behind it. I need to understand why it works. I want to know more. I'm hungry for learning. I can't be satiated. I want to know and understand. And I won't stop until I have done it. And I enjoy learning and I enjoy challenging myself. And the last is evolving value systems. The openness to revise personal, social, religious values when it's needed to, so that they can reflect what we consider best as opposed to just taking them in because authority, because of tradition, because someone tells me, because it's always been done this way, like the opposite of traditionalism. So as we can see, openness does refer to this rich inner experience and sounds a lot like overexcitabilities, huh? Yes, it does. That's what I thought when we were trying to come up with the idea of, okay, like why does this resonate so much with people? Could there be that we see some of these behaviors in gifted and talented individuals to a higher degree than in others, but we don't see it in everyone, but we don't, but we see it in some. Is there another explanation that follows the research? And yes, yes, there is. And it's called openness to experience, especially because of this part. A lot of the studies in gifted education and a lot of the, not even the research, a lot of the mentions, a lot of the daily use, daily conversations of overexcitabilities in gifted education practitioners and in families of gifted kids, they're used atheoretically. They're not seeing overexcitabilities as a key to advanced development, as a key that could lead to this fulfilling life through positive disintegration, but they're being used a theoretically as a trait, as something that gifted kids have, and they they just they're just like that. That's not what the actual theory says. And that's where it becomes a problem. When we use it as an explanation of something and we take it for, further than what's intended. And so that's why we boldly made the claim in one of the, the 2016 studies to say, call it like it is, openness to experience. Because that's an explanation that is rooted in science. So 
in the newest literature, the one thing that has happened is that first, in the original studies, we have some, we tried to see, okay, using a test of openness to experience and a test of overexcitabilities, do we see an overlap? We hypothesized that it would perfectly overlap. We now know it does not perfectly overlap. It overlaps almost perfectly. And so the fact that it didn't overlap 100%, some people, like some individuals used to say like, okay, you see, this is incorrect. The entire study is flawed. But why? Science is self-correcting. That is the main point of science. Like one study absolutely does not, like it's not the say all be all of all of any things. So in the last seven years, like many studies have investigated the relationship of openness to experience, to overexcited abilities. And so most of these studies show partial overlap, okay, to overexcited abilities to the openness traits. And so one question could be we can map the ones the facets that are not represented to other traits of the five factor model and then empirically test those relationships or we can see how do we refine what was found in the in the first study okay so in many of the studies what happens is that where openness and overexcitabilities don't display a precise overlap a lot of the studies take openness as a whole, okay? And not in their separate facets, which, which would be the parts that here are the ones that go back and forth. Vivid imagination with imaginational overexcitability. High aesthetic sensitivity with sensual overexcitability. Variety and depth of feelings with emotional overexcitability. We had originally hypothesized that eagerness to try new things would somehow relate to psychomotor overexcitability. It has a small relationship. It's not the exact same thing, but it has a small relationship. And intellectual with overexcitability with intellectual curiosity. Values, we did not know where it would fit because it is certainly mentioned in the theory of positive development, but this advanced moral development that gifted individuals are supposed to reach. And so, but you see, they map onto each other. They map onto each other. And so we might be talking about the same thing. We, if we're using it a theoretically, we might be using overexcitabilities to explain the behaviors that are actually related to openness to experience. So this back and forth in the literature is fascinating. The back and forth is fascinating because it has sparked a lot of discussions regarding measurement of overexcitabilities and of openness, regarding theory, like what is the role of a theory behind the, the claims that we're making and even more so the implications. So some of the studies that I have been very excited to read are the, the is the meta-analysis by Winkler and Voigt in Gifted Child Quarterly. And they have found that more, like fewer studies were included in the meta-analysis than they were excluded. And those exclusions were correctly done by the authors and mostly on methodological, methodological grounds, okay? Like authors of the original studies that either not report sufficient information to do a meta-analysis or did not have comparison groups. And so they found non-significant differences in psychomotor, small mean effect sizes in sensual and emotional overexcitabilities, medium mean effect sizes in imaginational and intellectual. And so we are surprised Again, we, were, we found it surprising that that was some of the things that people selectively chose to do, criticize in our study, okay? Rather than criticize some of the study in that meta-analysis, to be actual, to be honest. And so 
Then we have very interesting studies. We, act, we welcome the studies that were conducted by the team of Niki de Bond in, at the Universiteit van Antwerpen, where they have, act like, using state-of-the-art approaches like Bayesian uh, structural equation modeling and the fact that they're posting their M plus code online so that, they, so that people can replicate the studies. It is an amazing response. So they've published so far three articles, uh, and although they're made, were done with the same sample, they show support for like not abandoning the idea of overexcitabilities all in all. Where we might disagree, like I might disagree with the, with that last conclusion, but in the end, this is the back and forth we need to be having. This is the back and forth we need to be having so that we can decide, okay, what is an adequate framework to explain the things that we, that we want to explain? We, we talk to each other with science. This is not about our personal opinions. We need to follow the science, you know? There was a, a, a very interesting conversation with Salman Daglio in Journal of Advanced Academics on what is like what were the implications of that study? What are, what are the implications for openness to experience? What are some of the the views? Same and then we had a point and counterpoint uh, series of articles at Roper Review with. Uh, grant and then to which we responded with a very thorough and interesting criticism of our study because this is what we need to be doing we need to be talking about this we we must be able to openly disagree and to present arguments for that and to present evidence for that this is how science grows this is what we need as practitioners as well as as and as families families rely on us to give them the, like, the explanations of what they see. And so they deserve sound explanations. And then there was, there's a very interesting reflection on of Wells and Falk, which is a conceptual paper. It's not published like in a journal, it's not yet peer reviewed. And so like going from where, where overexcitabilities came from and where it is going and what the impact is. And taking very well the, the, the criticism that was made of you can't use this a theoretically just as a trait that people have, okay? Then I put the note there that there's actually other studies that appear in blogs that we could I could not trace them to actual journal publications. And so in that case, if they're not in the scientific literature, then they don't count as the body of research that we need to use to advance the field. So Okay, the controversy, the controversy. People are hearing about this and I don't want this to feel like this is some, just some researcher discussion of effect sizes and model fits and things that are not applicable to the real world, to the day-to-day -day basis on the classroom, on the family. Like if you're hearing like, okay, you're telling me my kid is not overexcitable, then what is he? He's open to experience. Openness to experience doesn't mean only wanting to try new things. Remember that is one facet, but it's a very like an attentiveness to inner and outer experiences. Coming from the five factor model of personality, it was empirically derived. Like it was created out of factor analysis of, hey, these are a lot of adjectives that people use to replicate, to talk about the these characteristics of personality. Let's see if we can get some common ground. And we found five major factors under which those could be subsumed. There are criticisms to this theory, of course, as there are criticisms to any theory. And so, yet still, it is the most widely used. It is the one that has been more effective, more parsimonious, simple to understand, and to elaborate. It did not start as a teleological or a developmental theory. It did not start as something that is taking you to higher development, okay? But, and so even more so, 
the, some of the controversies with openness itself is that the lower level structures, the facets themselves, like the little parts that take into like that go in there can be harder to determine. And so it has had a lot of names, factor five, creative mentality, openness to experience, openness, period, culture, intellect, experiencing, intellectuality, like the names, but they always refer to this richness of experience of this intensity of the drive to know to want to engage with the world and so some of the newer ones are saying that it might relate even to advanced development and so we know it's related to intelligence and we know it's related to creativity we know it's higher in gifted and creative samples and the studies that have been conducted and for a lot like for some of the for some of the implications of openness and how we it has such strong research support with thousands and thousands and thousands of studies i would tell you to go and look at the presentation by, the, by dr sheila gallagher who has gone be, before me she has an on-demand presentation on openness to experience in itself and how it can help conceptualize. We have a slightly different view on the theoretical part, but I think it's an extremely important and rich presentation in which you can see, like she presents studies and studies and studies of how openness relates to neural networks, to um, like to many different uh, parts of psychology and neuroscience. And that is the reason, one of the reasons that we should be looking at openness to experience within our field because this research support that it has it's across cultures it's uh, they the studies have been conducted on the personality of countries and so over 50 countries conducting studies on a lot of individuals across the lifespan how do we expect openness to rise and fall do like is that something that happens and we know that we know that it is and we know that it works across cultures it has been proven it has been tested it and it continues to be in, like empirically put to action so that is why i think it's the it's important to continue to refine the construct the fact that openness in the five-factor model is not without controversy itself is not a problem. It actually means that researchers continue to refine the construct so as it won't overlap, so as we won't fall into a jangle fallacy, which is what we think is happening with openness to experience and overexcitabilities. A jangle fallacy is when you call two apparently different constructs by different names, but in reality, they are the same. And this is what we're saying on this, okay? So the fact that we know more and that the, the research evolves and changes and some things are better said, like, is it openness, openness intellect? It just tells us that we're moving forward. Imagine now, we're in times of COVID. If science hasn't advanced and self-corrected, we might be still thinking that, that hydroxychloroquine might save people and that would be terrible. And so it's good to do the studies and to see, hey, this is not working, let's change it. Or, hey, this is working, let's keep it. Or, hey, this is working, but not the way we think and maybe not because of the way we think. And so for, we start with one thing and end with another. This is how science works. And this is why it's important to stick with openness to experience because it now actually has theoretical developments behind it. It started empirically, but now there are theories to explain. Okay. The five factor theory by, by McCray and Costa, for example, they said that this openness is, it's a tendency that we bring to the world. And then when we interact with the environment, we can adapt and develop attitudes and that influences our behaviors. And so it has a purpose. It serves a purpose. We engage with the world that way. Even further going to the another 
the theory by Rex de Young. By the, sorry, yeah, by the young of cybernetic big five theory, where openness, it has a purpose. It's cognitive exploration. We engage with the world through our openness to experience. We're the ones that go forward. We're like the people with openness are the ones that try out new things, the innovators, the creators. It's actually a marker of creativity. High openness to experience has been found over and over again to serve as a marker of high creativity. And so, and it also relates to well-being, okay? Because well-being for the cybernetic big five theory, it comes when personality is integrated to life circumstances and integrating the traits, the adaptations that we had to make and the needs. So to some degree, and maybe we can talk about seeking higher development in this area based on the newer theories of openness to experience. So even more so, because this is a critic, this is a criticism that has been done, like openness does not take us to advanced development. But how do we know? How do we know it doesn't? It's not whether it drives advanced development or not. Because, look, for example, that was one of the main points of Daglio saying that, okay, it's not a driving force of development and then it cannot replace overexcited abilities. Yeah, we have different views in the literature on that, okay? We might even wonder how open could be optimal. I did my PhD at the, lab, the counseling laboratory for exploration of optimal states at the University of Kansas with Dr. Barbara Kerr. And over there, as you, in the very name of our lab says optimal states. We wanted, we wanted to explore optimal states. What drives passion? What drives purpose? What drives flow? What drives creativity? All that makes life worth and exciting. So from the beginning, we, we cared about this. And we felt like openness is one of those things that comes over and over in the research that we do with, with creative adolescents. We even went as far as to ask ourselves, like how open is optimal? And Dr. Kerr has a hypothesis of the 95th percentile say, in which maybe the very high extreme is not helpful anymore. And those are like people very high in openness are prone to things are no longer conducive to their well-being. But hey, this is a hypothesis. We haven't tested this. We can't go around saying this until we empirically prove it. But it's a question, how open is optimal? So how do we know that openness does not relate to advanced development? Even more so, some theorists believe that it does, okay? The young and the creator of the cybernetic big five theory Talk about more complex and extensive interpretations of the world than people that are low in the trade. And so they probably use strategies that are more creative, more innovative to pursue their goals. Like, I think we can all resonate with this. More complex and extensive interpretations of the world that leads to different creative, innovative strategies. And either, even going even deeper, Going even deeper, Scott Barry Kaufman in his, in his book of, to, of Transcend, an exploration of humanistic psychology and what makes us grow and self-actualize, in, stated inclusively that openness like, can actually be a marker of self-actualization because openness is a known marker of creativity. Creativity is an open, a marker of self-actualization. And so that openness to experience can be indeed the catalyzing factor for that higher level development as it was devised by early humanistic psychologies like um, starting with Maslow, but Rogers, et cetera. So this is actually, like, he's saying that the Characteristics of openness to experience are centrally human. They make us be who we are and they help define and advance our species. So it might be that openness is related to advanced development in the sense of openness as we know it, okay? But 
regardless of those high pursuits or not, this is like, even if it's not related to advanced development, it's not a reason for ditching openness because we cannot force the world like we want it to look, like only retaining explanations that side with our worldview. But that becomes a bit dangerous when we're talking about science. And so this is the main reason, okay? Like that we think openness is still a good idea over and beyond over excitabilities. Because of overexcitabilities in and outside of the theory of positive disintegration. It is not in the name, it's in the claims, the things that people say, okay? Let's go on a little exercise with me. Reading a blog. The kid is sensitive. The kid cannot tolerate uh, tags. The kid cannot tolerate loud noises. The kid uh, needs everything to be symmetrical. Oh, the kid is actually pretty smart as well. And so, oh, must be overexcitable. And that is taken as an innate characteristic of giftedness, as if it was what it made the person gifted, okay? And here is where the schism comes. <laughs> Here's where actually two very different views go in, okay? So if the kid doesn't need to change, if this is just, oh, it's just an overexcitability. Oh, they're overexcitable. It's in the claims. What happens after that? People that like the the continue with the theory of positive disintegration should be as concerned as I am with the following misinterpretations of the theory. I see over and over in parent support groups, in blogs, in conversations, in between families. Oh, that's just how your kid is. Oh, they are like they they're overexcitable, and that is a trait of giftedness. And so how many kids are having real issues that we're just ascribing to overexcitabilities? We are letting a whole bunch of kids go unnoticed, untreated, not getting the help that they need because we're ascribing it as an atheoretical trait. And this is not an atheoretical trait. The point of overexcitabilities, the super, super, stimulatability as a, it's the original translation from Dombrowski. It's that this serves a purpose. This catalyzes further growth. And it, it's not just something that you have. Those are the base at the basic levels of the theory. The theory has five levels, remember. And so we cannot just sit back and relax and see how it is misused this way because ultimately it is not serving gifted children. It is not helping them. So the theory of positive disintegration is actually a very rich theory. As it was called by Wells and Falk, it's a strength-based theory. It's an approach to see things not in a pathological way. And to some degree, that's not what's happening. It is being used in a different way in which some people use it to allow behaviors that could be problematic or just as a theoretical traits. Oh yeah, they're just emotionally overexcitable. That's what it is, okay? And so this is not the way it should be using, okay? I, I want everyone to know and be like well aware that we're not against overexcitabilities and much less the theory of positive disintegration. Like, well, as I put there, what in the world do for and against mean in science? We follow the evidence. That's what we do, okay? The evidence as so far is not enough. There's few studies with few participants, with questionable methods, with inconsistent results. The, the overexcitability questionnaire that has been using has some studies where the psychometric properties are okay and in others it's not. And so 
where do we go from that? In other studies, uh, a new thing that has been said is that this is only for highly gifted individuals. In highly, profoundly, exceptionally gifted, this is where we see the difference. And there's not enough of those. And still, even if, if that is said, some of the studies actually do like, take a test and uh, use as gifted the highest 20% of the test. Like we are, we're not agreeing on what this needs to be. And so, of course, the results are inconsistent. And so what that means is that the evidence so far leads to unsustainable claims. Whereas that doesn't happen with the evidence for openness to experience. The evidence for openness to experience can be taken translate it and apply it directly. Openness to experience is related to intelligence. So that means it more people that score higher in intelligence tests tend to be higher on openness, yet not everyone that is very, very highly intelligent will score high on, will be high in openness, but they'll tend to be we know it has a very strong relationship with creativity. So people that score high in creativity will tend to be much more open. And so far the evidence of overexcitability doesn't get us there yet. And this is where I get the most concerned. When it becomes a circular definition, as in study in 2011 by Carmen, proposing that overexcitabilities might be a way to identify giftedness. This is where it becomes actually scary to me because we need to be saying, okay, what is giftedness? But what, in this, taking the definition of the Columbus group in, again, in parent groups, in uh, the countless groups and forums uh, in which we're in, Sometimes we see, oh, but my kid is overexcitable. So even if he's, if he didn't score high in, um, in their intelligence test, he must be gifted and they have to understand what, why he's behaving this way in school because giftedness equals overexcitability and overexcitability equals giftedness and they are not the same. <laughs> and so that circular definition gets problematic. I have even seen professionals in other parts of the world say that, okay, the test is not everything. We, what we need to see is a pattern of overexcitabilities. If the overexcitabilities are there, then the kid is gifted. This is a kid that has a personality trait called openness to experience. They are high in openness to experience. What do we mean by that then? And so we get to the same point that we've seen over and over again of the clashing paradigms, the gifted child paradigm versus the talent development paradigm. In where do we draw the line? Who's gifted? What is giftedness? And that is one of the things I see most problematic with continuing to use overexcitabilities as if it was a trait of the gifted. We're letting a lot of kids out. There are so many kids that we're not serving. There are so many people that we're not identifying because if it, if it takes overexcitability, what about that wonderful, brilliant, amazing thinker engineer that is not over, over excitable, not open to experiences that needs like that follows tradition and structure, but is brilliant? Well, will we leave him out with 146 IQ because the over excitabilities are not there? That's what we're saying. If we enter over excitabilities into the definition, the very definition of giftedness. That's what it's why it is problematic. Who are we serving? What are we talking about? And this is where I get scared. When I see that colleagues around the world sometimes only look at the pattern of over excitabilities and say, yeah, the test, the like intelligence or cognitive abilities or however you want to measure it is one part, but it's not all of it. We need to ask ourselves this question. We need to sit long and strong with this because even more so, if you are taking it only as personality traits, then you're describing a personality, okay? And 
you're only talking about the overexcitabilities and not where they get to the where they turn potential into advanced development. Because remember, that is the function. Okay, that is the function. So especially because going back to this, the theory of positive disintegration is a very complex theory. It has a lot of levels, and the ideal of that is the advanced developmental potential, not just a mere description of a set of traits called overexcitabilities. And so people, the regular people, like uh, moms, dads, people in schools, students themselves, gifted students themselves, families, practitioners, like in the way that you hear the conversations, they're not conceptualizing overexcitability as transforming function into higher levels. It is not being used as it is intended. And so it is just a set of descriptions and that becomes even worse when you take them just like in a circular fashion again. So the problem is not in the name, it's in the claims. So from the new studies that, has, that have come, there is a lot of common ground that we can find, okay? The first, like, is that overexcitability and giftedness, they're not synonymous. They're not the same thing, okay? And so openness to experience is a trait that is most often displayed in gifted individuals, in creative individuals. And openness to experience is a very sound explanation for what we have. And so we would, should all be concerned with the misuse of overexcitabilities because the studies focus just on that and not on the positive growth. And it's this positive growth that we care about in the end. This is what the, like, because you'll probably also be surprised to know that I read everything that I could get my hands on on the theory of positive disintegration before going into that, because yes, I am very open to ideas as well. And I like to know what I'm talking about. And I still make, make very many mistakes because it is a very complex theory that I don't pretend to understand in depth. And that is a concept of burden of proof. Burden of proof falls on the people that are trying to present something. If this theory is adequate, then the, the research needs to be done. The studies to prove the theory, because it's not just, it becomes dogmatic. And just following dogma is not what we need in the, in the field. So, Openness experience has this vast body of research. And the point here is a quote from a, a statistician called George Box says that all models are wrong. Some are useful. Okay. That you try to summarize the idea by that, that any attempt that we can do at modeling phenomena from the real world in statistical <laughs> instruments and models, like, will be a, just an approximation and that's wrong that's where it comes like all models are wrong some are useful okay so we should not be concerned with making the model more complicated by including all the possible variables that might perhaps intervene and in going above and beyond what we can actually account for in the model what should concern us is the practicality the usefulness of the most parsimonious model and the most parsimonious model is a five-factor model and openness to experience. So and this is another and one of the biggest reasons, okay? Open science. Open science is a movement of scientists so that we to be able to reproduce and replicate and hold consistent the studies that have been conducted. Okay, we, psychology in particular, as I am a psychologist, has a replication crisis. We have been finding in the past decade or so that a lot of the major studies in the field could not be replicated later on. That, and so we were operating on a set of beliefs that did not follow the evidence that were obtained once and then they could not be replicated. And this continues to happen because we need to, how do we do that? One of the ways, one of the, reason, the reasons why sticking to openness helps is because one study 
is not enough. What we need to do is be be able to aggregate bodies of research, okay? Like many studies, many studies, many studies, many studies saying the same. That's what's gonna take us to big knowledge, like to the sound knowledge. And so especially we need to be talking to other fields because gifted education usually has studies with small samples. Our subset of the population is small <laughs> by default, by design. And so what we need to do is collaborate with partner fields, collaborate with other fields of education, with neuroscience, with psychology. And so if the like if we're talking about the personality of gifted individuals, then we should be doing studies in personality psychology and with personality psychologists. Personality psychologists do research on openness. And so that's how we can aggregate that and we can make sure that we are able to do sound science and take all the knowledge there is about it, not just one study with 24 individuals or one study with 126 individuals or one study with 516, but just the, the same studies over and over. We need to be able to take everything into account. And so again, to improve the quality of the research, including pre-registering studies, pre-registering the analyses, to make sure that we do what we intended to do. Not that on the way, oh, I didn't find the differences that I wanted in between the uh, like the gifted sample and the regular population. And so let me change the analysis to see if I find something else. That's called p-hacking and we don't do that. It's not a cool thing to do. And that's what leads us to poor science. So pre-register studies, pre-register analysis. And so if all we've achieved with this is to enhance the quality of the research on overexcitabilities and the theory of personal development, we love it, we welcome it. I was, for example, very happy to see the M plus code for the, the studies of the bond for the studies on overexcitability, because that means we can reproduce the results with our samples and see, does it hold? Do we still stick to it? Does it work or not? So wrapping it up, here's why openness is still a good idea, okay? Openness and overexcitability could still appear to represent the same construct. They don't overlap perfectly, but they overlap generally. They overlap mostly they, in most, most, most of the things. And so for parsimony, we need to stick with a simpler explanation, especially if OEs are not being used in their full context, but also used as a simpler explanation. Like this is a trait that your kid has, okay? And so, yes, your kid is open to experience. And this is how open it, this is what we know about openness to experience. This is what we know when it peaks, when it when it goes down, how it, interf it intervenes. Because of psychological science, there's a lot of sound science on openness to experience. And so there's cross-cultural uh, research support, life, like across the lifespan, whereas overexcitabilities don't have enough research support yet, especially a theory of positive disintegration. That part, like that is the main depth that needs to be happening, okay? And the part that concerns me the most, this dangerous leap from overexcitabilities to the theory of positive disintegration, the presumed advanced morality without studies that actually test the positive disintegration and taking it as an identification of giftedness. If you are overexcitable, you're gifted. That is scary because like we're stepping on dangerous ground there. And plus it gives us shared vocabulary with other sciences. In practice, we can help like interpreting the behaviors. We see that. We see the kid that is very concerned with this. We see the kid that doesn't stop until they know, until they understand the things that, that they, until they have closure. We hear the questions. We know the wonderful worlds that they create in their minds. It's called openness to experience on the side of practice and on the side of research because it permits meta-analysis, generalization, because we can aggregate the research and be much more confident of what we're saying, much more confident that this is an actual explanation. So let's, let's do what's best for the kids. They require rigorous and challenging education, kids with high ability and openness to experience. They need training in intellectual and creative endeavors, and we should not 
pathologize personality or glorify personality not from the sense that oh this is a problem and uh, it's just that they are that they have this uh, trait they're more profound and so like it cannot be an excuse for problematic behaviors because sometimes we might be actually looking at anxiety that is being untreated adhd that is being untreated depression that is being untreated under the name of overexcitabilities and a supposed personality trait that they possess just by virtue of being gifted. They might be something else. And so this is why we need to stick to the science and think, okay, openness to experience. What an interesting personality trait and the many application it has for gifted education and for gifted individuals. Let's partner with other sciences. Let's read all there is to read about openness to experience in the liter the scientific literature and psychology and everything and see how much, how rich the experience can be and how much we can interpret the behaviors based on that. And so with that, thank you. I am extremely happy and I look forward to hearing the questions and I hope they're challenging because it is these debates are lively and that will take us to our common ground, which is the well-being and talent development of the families and the people that we serve. Alex, thank you so much for taking what is clearly a very complex area and for breaking that down for us in a really interesting and accessible way too. So thank you so much. Um, there's lots of comments come in, um, lots of people agreeing with you, really excited um, by the work you're doing, great ideas for sparking conversations and so on. And we started the day with a call for educators and researchers to work together. And I think we're finishing the day with a call for cross -listed disciplinary, interdisciplinary studies to, to take place too. I think in the interest of time, we've probably only got time for one question. And so, um, ah, <laughs> not, this does not mean your question wasn't good, but here, here's the one I'm going to go with. Um, okay. You said, um, are you saying openness to experience is a companion to overexcitability or another tool for self-actualization as the theory of positive disintegration processes. I also acknowledging that TPD isn't just a self-actualization theory. Would you have any comment to make about that? I would actually remind of the, the it can be, uh, let's say, it can be a path to self-actualization because openness is linked to passion, to growth, to like, be, taking that rich experience of the world. OK, in the end, what concerns me the most is that the TBD is not being used for self-actualization, <laughs> is that people are taking it a theoretically. Yes, it, like if we take it like that, it is a tool to our self-actualization. And I know we know it's not just that. And so properly used. Wonderful. That's not the way it's trickling down. It is trickling down as this entity, as if this fixed thing that just is. And that just because I have the overexcited abilities, I will get to advanced, develop, like, advanced development. That's not what is happening. And so, yes, openness to experience with even like without the without looking at it through the lens of positive disintegration can lead to a very rich, very fulfilling life. Alex. Thank you. We've got so many questions. I think we could go on for so much longer. We need another hour, but we haven't got it. I'm certainly going to push the boundaries tonight and choose something different off the menu. So um, thank you for sharing all of these ideas. Really interesting and I think um, really exciting places for, for this work to go. So thank you so much. Can I also, as it's the end of day two, thank everybody who's here uh, and for all the different sessions that you've attended. Please come back for day three, which of course is a week away. That gives time for lots of thoughts to percolate. Get them onto social media and um, share with us what you're doing. And Alex, we'd be more than happy to respond to questions if you um, contact her through the chat. Isn't that a fabulous facility? Find somebody and chat to them that you've seen in a session. So please use that um, to, to contact Alex if you've got more questions. And all it leaves for me to say is, 
Have a wonderful day, whatever bit of the day is left for you. And we will see you all next week, next Saturday, ready for day three of our conference. Thank you so much, everybody, and see you soon.